All right, so this is the first lecture of unit four, the nutrition unit, and chapter 28 is about vitamins, and we've broken it up into two lectures for you. So the first lecture here, we'll talk about fat-soluble vitamins, and then the next lecture, we'll talk about water-soluble vitamins. So first, just an overview of vitamins in general. So you have the fat-soluble vitamins. These are vitamins D, A, K, and E, and you can remember them as DAKE. And they are absorbed in the gut, and they require special help from the pancreas and the intestines. So they have to be really absorbed the same way fats are through my cells to get across the intestinal mucosa. And so, again, this can create problems if, if patients have problems with absorbing fats. And there are certain diseases where you can see that, really where you have problems with absorption in general, and then also problems with absorbing fats specifically. So diseases such as Crohn's, cystic fibrosis, celiac sprue, and other gut disorders they can cause a deficiency of fat-soluble vitamins for this reason. So you want to pay attention to that. So not only can these diseases have the signs and symptoms relevant to their direct pathology, but they can also develop the signs and symptoms of fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies. The other thing about fat-soluble vitamins is they can accumulate and be stored in fat tissue for a long period of time. Now the water-soluble vitamins, just very briefly here, we'll, again, the next lecture will be dedicated to these. These are vitamins B1, B2, B3, B5, 6, 7, 9, 12, and then vitamin C. And you may have heard of some of these before because we mentioned them a lot in Unit 3 because they are often coenzymes that are necessary for enzymatic reactions during metabolism especially, or they can be precursors to organic cofactors such as NAD+. And you can see this figure here. They're, they are required for a number of really important reactions within the body. Most water-soluble vitamins are not stored in the body for long periods of time, except for vitamin B9 and B12. B9 is stored in the liver for three to five months, and then B12 is stored in the liver for three to four years. So now we'll go into each of the fat-soluble vitamins individually. So first, vitamin D, and for each of these vitamins, we'll, we'll talk about the function of the vitamin, and then we'll talk about the signs and symptoms of, of the deficiency of the vitamin, and then in some cases, we'll even talk about if the vitamin is in ex excess, because there's some of these vitamins where if you have them in excess, that's, that can create problems as well. So the function of vitamin D is it allows for absorption of calcium and phosphate, and then I would actually add magnesium as well to this in the intestine, and then it also promotes reabsorption in the nephron of the kidney. The other thing is that vitamin D is synthesized in the skin. And this is, as you may know, induced by UV light from, from the sun. And so that's why sun exposure can be helpful for ensuring you have adequate levels of vitamin D. Now, vitamin D deficiency, this can be caused by a number of different things. So limited sun exposure, it's also been seen in individuals with dark skin that live in temperate climates. That's not fully understood. And then also patients that are malnourished, so nutritional problems, and then patients with renal failure as well. Clinical features. Now, obviously, since vitamin D is so important for maintaining calcium levels, you can see hypocalcemia, which can result in the symptoms of hypocalcemia, which would be tetany, muscle spasms. And that's because calcium is so critical for really two things. One, for inducing muscle contraction and then also for maintaining electrical gradients across membranes, which is important for, again, muscle contraction, and then also arrhythmias, nerve function, and then obviously you can see muscle weakness as well. The other thing that vitamin D is really important for is promoting bone mineral mineralization. That makes sense because calcium and phosphate are such important components of bone structure, and so if you have inadequate bone mineralization, that affects bone structure. And so in, patient, in children with vitamin D deficiency, if, if it's severe enough, you can see what's called rickets, where they have very weak, pliable bones, and they'll have deformed bones, as you can see in this x-ray here. This is called bowing of the legs. This is a very high-yield image. You could definitely see this on an exam, biochem exam, or a board exam, so definitely commit this to memory. And then in, in adults, it's called osteomalacia. And so these patients will have bone pain and muscle weakness. Now, for vitamin D excess, this is not a good thing because you can develop hypercalcemia and the symptoms that go along with that, such as formation of renal stones within the urinary tract, psychiatric problems, and then abdominal pain. And this can be seen in sarcoidosis and other granulomatous diseases. So vitamin A is an antioxidant similar to vitamin E. And so when vitamin A is, is found in food, it's ingested in the form of the retinol ester. 
When it makes its way to the small intestine, it gets converted into retinol, which can serve as a, a storage component of vitamin A. And then eventually it can get converted into retinol, which is the visually active form. And obviously vitamin A, as we say here, it's an important component of retinol or converted to retinol, which can serve as a visual pigment. And it's important for the function of the retina within the eye. Vitamin A also regulates the differentiation of epithelial cells in tissues such as the skin, the pancreas, and other places of epithelial tracts via retinol and retinoid. So here's retinol as the structure again here. It can also be used therapeutically to treat acute promyelocytic leukemia, and that would be via altrans retinoic acid, and then can also be used to treat severe acne in the form of oral isoretinoin. Now, if you have vitamin A deficiency, this can obviously result from, as we said before, malabsorption problems, problems absor absorbing fat-soluble components. Clinical features, obviously because it plays such an important role for the retina, you can have night blindness, keratomalacia, which is corneal degeneration, you can eventually develop into blindness, zero ophthalmia, and then bateau spots on the conjunctiva. And so here's where they can, they're kind of these spots, as you can see here, that can appear on either side of the eye like this. And so definitely be aware of this. You could, you could definitely see a picture of this on your exam. The other thing that these patients can have is dry skin, xeros cutis, and then keratinization of the epithelium. Vitamin A excess is really divided into either acute or chronic. So if they have an acute elevation of vitamin A, patients are going to present with vomiting, nausea, and blurry vision. Again, that eye component here. If they're chronically ingesting high amounts of vitamin A, so they develop chronic to toxicity, they're going to have dry skin, pseudotumor cerebrae, joint pain, and then severe hepatic toxicity. The other thing about vitamin A is it's highly, highly teratogenic. So if a developing fetus gets exposed to it, they could develop cleft palate, cardiac defects, and then developmental defects. So vitamin K is really important for the clotting cascade, and mainly that's because it enables the gamma carboxylation of glutamate residues on blood clotting proteins by acting as a cofactor for that reaction. And this reaction occurs in the liver, and specifically allows for the proper production of clotting factors 2, 7, 9, 10, and protein CS. Now vitamin K can be taken in the diet, but it's also synthesized by bacteria that reside in the intestines. Therapeutically, vitamin K can be given for warfarin overdose. Warfarin, also known as Coumadin, is an anticoagulant, and if it's taken in an excessive amount, it can put patients at risk for bleeding. And so to treat for that, you give vitamin K to help replenish these clotting factors. Now, vitamin K deficiency, as you can imagine, results in increased risk of bleeding because you have lack of production of, the, of these proper clotting factors. So as a result of that on the lab, you're going to have increased prothrombin time, or PT, and also increased partial thromboplastin time. The thing is, bleeding time will remain normal because, remain, remember, bleeding time corresponds to platelet levels and platelet function, and vitamin K is not involved in platelet production or platelet function. The thing to watch out for is neonatal hemorrhage, and this is because neonates cannot synthesize vitamin K because they don't have the bacteria colonizing the intestine yet. The other thing that contributes to this is that vitamin D and then vitamin K are not present in breast milk and then have to be supplemented. So at birth, a vitamin K injection must be given to prevent hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. Vitamin K deficiency can also result from prolonged use of broad-spectrum antibiotics, such as cephalosporins. The other thing that can cause vitamin K deficiency is liver damage. And again, that's because those gamma carboxylation reactions that use vitamin K as a cofactor for production of those clotting factors occur in the liver. So the last of the fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin E, it acts as an antioxidant, and it protects the membranes of cells, such as red blood cells, from oxidizing damage. So vitamin E deficiency is actually pretty rare, but it, you can definitely see it in certain conditions. For example, premature birth puts patients at risk for vitamin E deficiency, and then any disorder that results in malabsorption, especially being able to absorb fats and lipids. Some clinical features, hemolytic anemia, and then ancanthocytosis. And this is a result of weakening of the red blood cell membrane because remember vitamin E helps protect membranes from damage. And by weakening that red blood cell membrane, that can lead to lysis of red blood cells. You can also see retinitis pigmentosum in patients with vitamin E deficiency. And then remember A-beta lipoproteinemia. This is a disorder we talked about back in unit three where patients have problems with absorbing fats. They can also develop vitamin E deficiency, but also in these patients, you're going to see dorsal column and spinocerebellar tract demyelination, 
because vitamin E plays a crucial role in nerve function and transmission of neural impulses. And remember the dorsal columns are responsible for position and vibration. So your ability to sense position and vibration, which would also be called proprioception. Now this is similar to vitamin B12 deficiency because vitamin B12 deficiency can also cause demyelination of the dorsal columns and present with lack of position and vibration sense. Except vitamin B12 deficiency also has megaloblastic anemia, hypersegmented neutrophils, and then increased levels of methylmalonic acid. And you're not going to see any of these in a patient with vitamin E deficiency. So that's how you can distinguish these two deficiencies. They both have this, this similar neurological presentation, but vitamin B12 also has these unique hematological and biochemical presentations. All right, so that closes out our discussion of fat-soluble vitamins. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about water-soluble vitamins.